All right, welcome. I'm Ryan Holger with TEC, and today I'm lucky enough to have with me Dan Olivier. Dan has been doing carrier controls probably since I was born, or pretty close to it. I met Dan 20-some years ago, and he was the uh, local Midwest expert then. So he has tons of knowledge. Feel free to interrogate Dan with questions. Um, you can type them in the question box there, or if you have a really weird, crazy question, you can ask me and I can unmute you as well. But as of right now, you guys are all muted just to make things a little smoother. But you can type questions in whenever you want. Um, this is a, kind of an overview type thing, but we can at, answer specific questions as well. We were going to do a two-day hands-on class, but obviously uh, that's not happening right now. So this is kind of the next best thing. So with that, I'm going to stop blabbering, and I'm going to let Dan talk. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, like I said, my name is Dan Olivier, I've been, and as, as Ryan said, I've been doing this since about uh, 1986 when Generation One Parker first came out. For those who have ever seen one of those, so um, I've always said that this is this presentation is not for me; it's for you. So please um, do interrogate uh, questions out or raise your hand for questions. We'll try to go over those things. Also, I don't know if I can cover all of Carrier Comfort Network in, in an hour and a half. Um, I do talk fast. I drink a lot of coffee, as anybody who's ever heard me know. But um, if need be, um, and we don't get into the parts where it really means something to you, we can always have another one of these later on. Um, and we'll talk about that towards the end also, because there's a lot of software parts of it that I, I will not have a full time to get to that I think are important. So, um, But I would like to talk to you about something that's dear to me, and that's Carrier Comfort Network. Um, the word CCN means that, just that carrier comfort network. It's been around since the 19, uh, late 1980s. Um, so it, it has a long history here. Um, it's been a tried and true communication scheme for me. Um, it is a proprietary communication bus. And by proprietary, it means that it was developed by carrier and it was used for carrier and carrier was the only one who could do anything with it. And as the world has gone and things go, um, engineers and building owners don't like proprietary buses. They want to be able to talk to, uh, have a lot of people talk at, at the same language with different types of control. So you'll hear words like backnet and mod bus, those kind of things now, um, which are the protocols of choice. But carrier cover network has been around a long time. It's tried and true and does certainly have a lot of stuff left uh, working out there. Like I say, it was developed in the 1980s by Hamilton Standard, which was the aerospace division of Carrier, uh, our United Technology at the time. So it really is rocket science when it comes to how it was working, and that's why it has endured so well. Um, I'm just going to go in a little bit of the bus architecture with you, so you kind of understand how it works and, and what the piece, and then I'll go over the pieces of the bus and how we tie things together to make it a complete system. First of all, the bus is a peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol. What that means is that we do not have what they call MSTP type technology, which most backnet buses do. This thing says anybody who wants to say anything can say something on a, on a carrier bus. So when it comes out to it, if you've got something to talk to, if you've got a, uh, something to broadcast, or you want to interrogate something, any, any device can do it at any time along this communication bus. Um, the interface of the PC is for viewing only. It does not require a PC for any kind of operation or any kind of uh, or any kind of controlling. All programming, all programs and controls are inside the controller itself. So you can take the PC out of there, you can take the audio out of there, or other interface devices, and the system will operate just fine. We talked about elements on a CCN bus. You know how many things are physically tied to the communication bus. You can have up to 239 elements on a standard bus. Okay, and of these things, we can have things called bridges on there, which can communicate up to 238 of these on that bus, which each could have 239 devices. So if it really came down to it, and you had a full-blown carrier comfort network out there, it would have 57,129 devices that could talk to it at one time. So it, it is a very powerful bus. It's got a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility to it. And I want to go over some of the things that would tie into it now and, and, and make it go. As you know, the carrier CCM product line has been um, growing over the years. We have things for front ends up on the top up here. You can see the CCM with the IU, the interfaces, those kind of things. We have network devices like routers that allow people to tie other buses in, not only locally 
on the site or but also other buildings wherever through the internet. Uh, programmable controllers, the giant boiler, those kind of things, and also application specific controllers, which would be AV boxes, fan coil boxes, and stuff we were talking about. The bus is an RF45 communication, like we talked about. It runs primarily at 9600 baud, which may seem extremely slow to most people, but it is a very, very solid uh, communication scheme. Um, I always say this is as bulletproof as any communication bus can be. It's a three wire, 18 gauge shielded cable. Most of the buses today are two wire, 22 gauge shielded. This one is a three wire, okay? So um, it can run up to 4,000 feet and communicate along those lines, but would require a repeater or a booster about every 1,000 feet or so. Elements are wired daisy chain, okay? So that um, just like anything else, you run in and you run out. There is no, there's a beginning and an end. There's no loop in this thing. But what's unique about this bus is there are no termination resistors. You do not have to put something on, on, the, on the start on the end of the bus. You just run the bus from a start line to a finish line and communicates along that line. And when we address any element on this bus, it's not dependent on physical location, like most of the things. It is done by how the name you give it, not the location on the bus. So how do we determine who's who on a carrier CCN bus? Each bus has two unique names on it. The first name is the bus number, and the second name is the element number. So when we talk to somebody on the bus, we always refer to it in those two categories. It's a, it's a bus number, which is typically zero, comma, by the element number, one through 239. All CCN devices are programmed, are given an address through software. Software of some sort, whether you plug directly into it or along the bus itself, this is the only way you can uh, address a CCN element. There's no dip switches, there's no rotary switches in order to do that. The bus, the bridge address, any bridge that's on here, and again, a bridge is something that creates a secondary bus, has to be attached to bus zero. So it'll always have a bus zero to it, but the element address of that bridge creates the secondary bus of that nature. So if we had a bridge at zero comma seven, he would have a bus coming out of it at seven, seven comma one through 239. So that's important to know that when you're on the, the structure of this thing, that all bridges are on bus zero, but they create the secondary buses that ha have several other elements on it. And Dan, the, typical, most buildings are just going to have one bus usually, right? I mean, like 80% yeah. of the buildings probably just have one, so you're almost always on bus zero unless the building gets fairly large and complex. Right. Every CCN has a bus zero as a primary bus. That's true of all of these things. And like Brian said, most buildings only have a bus zero. But you get into many larger complexes and stuff, they do have several buses on them, and this is how you have to identify. So, but you're right. Bus zero is bus zero is the primary bus, and um, is most most buildings only have that. So a typical bus might be look something like this, where you have several pieces of equipment along the bus, including controllers that will do programming with the auxiliary functions like cooling towers and pumps and boilers and etc. Okay. Again, bus zero is called our primary bus, and every CCN has a bus zero, has to have a bus zero. And elements are addressed according to you see, zero comma two, zero comma two thirty nine fifty. Uh, again, any of these things can, can absorb a, a unique address, but that has to be a unique address. It doesn't matter if the cumber controller is at one or at 101. It doesn't matter if the chiller is at address number seven or address number 204. It just that everything has to be unique. You cannot have duplicate addresses on the bus, like any other bus. So you, you get into the situation where you have the larger buildings with the larger structures. You can see here's our bridges on here. And these bridges are wired on the bus, the primary bus, they're on the purple and blue here. You can see all of our bridges are hardwired onto that. And they create that secondary bus that allows you to have other systems on that. So all these things are intertwined together it can talk from one central source up here, be a, be a computer, be a, uh, an iView, or whatever we want to interface to it. We can all talk to everything from one location, and, but information is shared either along its own bus or along the entire CCN. You can see that when we create, when we address the bridges, like this bridge is at zero number two, 
it actually creates a bus too. So all the elements on these buses would, would absorb the two first and then the 86 or the three and then three, one, three, two, three, four. You see on the Anderson scheme. So anytime we address the bridge, that secondary bus is created from the bridge's address. Broadcasting, as you might guess, one of the advantages of, of any kind of uh, DDC system is to be able to share data and, and not have to run um, you know, multiple time programs, multiple outdoor air sensors, multiple languages. So broadcasting is done on the CCN bus. The source element can be any, any device. Any device can talk on this bus and, get, and, and, and broadcast an entire CCN network. Information like time and date, holidays, those kind of things are shared like any other system would have. Outside air temperature is another one that's broadcast to everybody or can be broadcast just locally. It doesn't matter. It can be sent, like I say, it can be sent globally to everybody on the whole CCN, or it can be sent to a bus at a time or even just to a device. One of the rules of the CCN bus and this is true of every CCN bus, is that every, everything out there must be acknowledged, okay? We call these things a broadcast acknowledgement. Broadcast acknowledgement is very, very critical on a bus, and it has, has a very simple rule. Every bus has to have a broadcast acknowledgement, okay? So what happens is that when somebody broadcasts information such as outside air, somebody on that bus says, I have to have it, and then the bus goes north. If it doesn't, Get acknowledged. The the uh, the broadcast is repeated over and over and over again. So you can see it's critical that we have somebody on there saying, "I've got this information." Okay, go on. So this is the usual. Um, you only have to have one broadcast acknowledger on a bus, but and it is only one. If you have multiple or you have none, it's the same effect. So if somebody keeps doesn't get that information acknowledged. It will keep broadcasting it over and over again. Okay. What we do is, is typically on any communication bus is we make the lowest address on that bus the broadcast acknowledge. Okay, just as a rule of thumb. So if you're looking for the broadcast acknowledge or you're checking for it, that's normally where it is. A global broadcaster cannot be acknowledged. Okay, and a bridge can't be acknowledged. In the same way, alarms are acknowledged, but we have one alarm acknowledger for CCN. And that resides on bus zero. Okay, so when we talk about alarms, and, the, and normally we're talking about IBU or something like that point who's going to do something with the alarm, they're usually the alarm acknowledger, but we can only have one for CCN. So if we have multiple things that can do that, only one of them can be set up as the acknowledger. So to go back into it, a broadcast acknowledger is one for bus, an alarm acknowledger is one for system. Okay. And can the same device do both jobs? Can you have one device be the broadcast acknowledger and the alarm acknowledger? Uh, yes, you can. But you know, it's it's. But we not normally how we set it up. We've always um, taught to set up the broadcast acknowledger the lowest device on the on the bus, and usually the alarm acknowledger is something that's going to show the alarms anyway. So it's always either a telehealth or a, you know that in the old days or a, or a front end. But um, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. certain devices can be alarm acknowledgers. Someone who wants an alarm, essentially, like a front end. Right. There's only certain ones that allow you to do that. You go back to the screen. Only a couple of these devices can be alarm acknowledgers. Otherwise, it's limited to a few. And that's only because they're the ones who handle the alarms. Alarms aren't handled by everybody equally. So um, it's not like they get all the information and stuff. Alarms are sent to some front end so the, uh, the operators know what's going on. And there's also some buildings that don't have a front end, so hence when those guys can't be the acknowledger, so you have to use like a system pilot or a VVT stat or something like that to be the acknowledger, which would be. Well, in that case, you wouldn't need an alarm acknowledger because there's no alarm being sent. You have a choice on every device to be able to send its alarms out to the front end or not to do anything with it. In a case where you have nothing to do with the alarms, you wouldn't need an alarm acknowledger because it wouldn't be an alarm sent out to the front end. Good point. Okay, so those are the those are the broadcast rules. And again, time broadcasters, one per system. You have to figure out where that. I mean, you don't want two or three different time broadcasters. 
uh, the same CCN, otherwise they'll overwrite each other and you'll have stuff at the same time of day forever. You know, you usually want one outside air temperature sensor broadcast per system because otherwise you get outside air writing over each other on other devices and that doesn't work. So normally when you set up a bus, you'll know these things, but when you're walking into it, it's, it's difficult sometimes to figure where these things are. And when we get into the service tool part of it, um, probably on another class, we can show you how to determine who's doing what as far as the communication bus scheme goes. Okay. The other things that get broadcast, and we'll talk a little more about it, is will be will be scheduled, you know, and then we'll um, those have a unique way of same way of uh, of being broadcast throughout the bus also. I'd like to get into what actually components make up a CCN, what actually carrier has developed, and keeping in mind that carrier is one of the first and is still one of the only ones that have the equipment manufacturers and the control manufacturer be the same company. So we talk naturally to our pieces of equipment. They talk together, they're meant for each other. So whether you have large, what they call product integrated controls that come out of our large chillers, rooftop units, air handlers, and those kinds of things, or you have more application specific controllers like VAV boxes, small tonnage rooftop, those kind of things, they all fit together on one carrier comfort network. But the factory mounted option is usually available on most of these things or field interface. Product integrated control. Okay. I don't know if anybody of you recognize what this is, but if you have an older pre-2001 chiller, rooftop, those kind of things, you'll have what they call a product integrated control. That's a, a PSIO. I mean, they call them fixed. Um, I want to spend a couple of seconds on this thing. If you ever see one of these things, there's one thing I want you to know right away about this thing is that this is a processor called an 8088 processor. It was developed by Hamilton Standard. It, it was carry use these things exclusively in large tonnage rooftops and chillers, and it worked very, very well. But it is 100% RAM. It's full of information. It does work. It, it's, it's durable as hell. But being 100% RAM, if it loses power, it loses its memory. So inside of it, down here, I don't know if you can see my mouse on that, but down here, there's a little battery compartment. This has a battery. If you know nothing else from today's class, and you ever see one of these things, is you know that this battery needs to be changed every so often. It's been the last four to five years. I recommend changing them every three years at the most. But if you lose power to that chiller or that rooftop, and that battery is dead, that chiller is dumb, or that rooftop is dumb, it will not work. These things have to be reloaded at that time. Well, that's not usually a convenient thing to do. So the battery that goes in here is the same for all of these 8088 processors. It's a 3.6 volt double A lithium non-rechargeable battery. Again, 3.6 volt double A lithium non-rechargeable battery. You can get them at Batteries Plus or a battery store. They cost you 10, 12 bucks a piece, but it's critical that these things be in there in case of a power outage. For anybody who's ever come across one of these things and turned the power off of a rooftop unit to change the filter and you've gone back on, it doesn't come back to life, you know what I mean. These things happen a lot. So uh, again, when you do change your battery in one of these, if it's a rooftop unit and you've never done it before, you'll know that these things sit on the sides of the cabinet of the controls compartment of the rooftop unit. It's usually up on top of a large um, um, frame that has to get up on there and within about six inches of it are all the contactors for the fans and the, and the condensing unit. So you've got line voltage within a very short distance of where this thing sits and you have to do this while there's power on the unit. So it becomes a challenge at that. But you have to do it and um, when you do it down here, it's, it, it, um, chances are if it's never been done before, you're going to find a lot of crud inside of the thing that needs to be cleaned up, but it's a critical thing that has to be done. These pick units were very, very popular up until 2001, like I said. Then we switched over to what they call the comfort link. I'm sure many of you have seen these comfort links. It's still used today. I will say that even though know, CCN is, is, a, is a proprietary system that is not as popular on the, on, the, uh, on the field side much anymore, Carrier still uses as its native language CCN for all its large tonnage rooftops and its chillers. So you are going to find these things. And when you find now with product integrated controls on the larger units, you'll find this comfort link. And you'll know the comfort link is, it's one of those guys that have the, have the red uh, lettering in it with the escape enter button. The lettering is the stuff you can't see within the sunlight, you know the story. But this thing is a, is a very um, 
easy to use tool to interrogate the unit. You can, you can do anything you can do actually from a computer through here, including programming it, troubleshooting it, putting it in a test mode, all those kind of things. One thing about a, comp uh, a comfort load controller is that when you see the abbreviation up in the screen here, if you didn't know what it means, if you double mash or press escape and enter at the same time and release it, across the screen will go the information that this will be doing. So if you, for instance, in the alarm mode and you press enter and it says it's, it's a, a T141, and you go, what the hell is a T141? You simply press and escape, a, you press, uh, an, uh, press and release, excuse me, escape and enter at the same time. And you will see that a, a T141 might be a compressor D lockout or, or whatever it happens to be. So that's something that's, that's, uh, that's very, uh, very easy about these things to use. Another thing about these cover lights is as they get older, you may notice that pressing these buttons don't work as well as they start to wear out. Uh, unfortunately, that's a, that's a picture. You can try pulling the face off of these things and taking a pencil eraser and using the pad that, that, that makes contact with the inside unit um, and just try to clean those contacts up a bit. That certainly has worked in the past. I don't guarantee it, but it's something to try before you try to replace something. For a service tool, for a service guy who works on a lot of these units, there's a handheld comfort link unit called a navigator. The navigator is a very, very flexible device that allows you to plug into the ports within the rooftop units on here. Showing that and also they usually have multiple ports on a unit to use these navigators. So if you're in the back end doing pressure or you're in the compressor side of it, there's ports for these things, but it gives you three lines of display. And also gives you the, the ease to, to stretch this thing out and do your testing and do your servicing while watching this thing right here. And Dan, that navigator will only work on a comfort link, right? Not the old black box picks that you showed? Correct. This is only from the newer style ones, and the newer by 2002 and above that have the, have that have that main base for it, or the comfort link control. But it will put it, uh, all the units are now presented with all these clubs and you can plug into these agents in multiple locations within the unit. Very handy. Other controllers that we have along here we're going to get into now are some of the application specific controllers like DAD boxes and our programmable control. To tie all the auxiliary functions in and work with those rooftops. Applied controllers. Again, we talked about chillers, air handlers, those kind of things. Unitary controllers, they come factory mounted. VAV boxes can be factory mounted. So can rooftop units have the factory mounted controls on them. So let's get into some of those things. And we turn those things as application specific controllers. That means that these controllers have one function in life. A VAV controller is a VAV control the VAV box. A rooftop controller can only control a rooftop unit. The same kind of thing like that. It's very, it's very, very nice for a service guy or anybody else to use because you replace one of these things. It, you don't have to go through a whole programming scheme to tell this gun controller what it's going to do. It knows it's a VAV controller or it knows it's a rooftop controller. You simply have to add the data to it that makes it unique to the system. So some of the some of the more popular controllers we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about our VBT or 3D system and our VAV or comfort ID system. There is a difference between the two. I'll spend a little time on what that difference is. But but these are our most popular devices out there because there's mostly multiple of these per building, multiple zones for any piece of equipment. Variable volume is their most popular, and the largest ones. This is where you deal with the large tonnage up until a while ago, large tonnage, but now VAV controllers are all the way down to five tons. Uh, so uh, it's no longer meant for just real large things. But what it, what it really is is a way to get large pieces of equipment and large number of of zones within a building to coordinate each other and get a, get a system that operates efficiently and comfortably. In the old days, a VAV system was something that said, okay, I have a time clock on here. In the morning when I wake, when, I, when the building wakes up, I want to bring my heat on, bring my returner up to 72 degrees. Once I get to that, I'm going to give you 55 degree air all day long. It's up to the, zone, the individual zones to really reheat that air as it needs it or, or, or uh, evaluate the sample to take more or less of the cooler. With electronic VAV came along, it was a whole different system. In this system, the unit told the space what it could have. In this system, is a way for the space now to tell the unit what it needs, and then the unit then responds to that. So no longer does the heat come on and blast the zone up to 72 degrees, no matter how hot it is in the other zones. 
these individuals own the Amber will tell you that they have enough heat or need more. It also doesn't necessarily mean you need 55 degree air all day long. We actually can tell the unit by the average temperature of everybody in here compared to the average space temperature that we don't need 55 anymore. We can get by with maybe 60 or 65 degrees of right here. That is a whole different level of comfort. Not only does it take less to reheat that air and will not cause the zone to overheat, overcool as fast, but the air coming out of the diffuser is much more mild, so it isn't dropping on people and it's a lot more comfortable. So not only are you saving money by not reheating all that air, you're, you're getting more comfortable system as well. And here's how that kind of works again. The VAV controller is a standard controller like you see here. It, it's, it's got electronic in here plus a damper motor tied to it, and underneath the cover here is a pressure sensor. These are pressure independent, meaning that it will calculate the CFM that comes out of the zone and regulate the damper based upon design CFM from that particular zone. Then you cover different you can set them up for different things for cooling only, for reheat, or for parallel series standby. Okay. They're built to 9,000 CFM, and we, can, we operate up modulating or up to three stages of reheat. Inputs include CFM to the flow ring, damper position. There is a feedback on the damper motor that tells you the actual damper position, phase temperature, and spot supplier temperature. And the outputs go to the damper, the heating valve, and maybe a fan if you have a uh, fan box. You can have up to 128 of these things linked together that will operate the system to tell the rooftop units or resources as we tell it what to do. And this is where I want to kind of talk a little bit about linkage. Linkage is the mode and the language that carrier uses to have the zone system talk to the air handle or the air source. We don't need all 128 zones here interrogating the rooftop unit at one time. What happens is, is that one zone on the VAD boxes talk and interrogate all the other 120 up to 127 more zones on there, compile that information, determine what needs of the space are, and give that information to the rooftop unit. The rooftop unit now only talks to one guy called the linkage master. And we only have one linkage master per system. His job, again, is to interrogate and coordinate all the information that comes from the zoning system and give that information to the rooftop. Information like occupancy, information like average zone temperature, information like average zone set point. So now what the rooftop is looking at is a temperature based upon set point of a large number of systems that will average out that stuff and make this make the rooftop work in, to, to the benefit of all the, all the uh, 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 tenants. There is a couple of rules on how to set up a linkage system. Um, we talked about addressing didn't mean anything by where the thing is located. But within a VAV system, or a VVT for that matter, addressing becomes critical as to how these things communicate. The linkage factor is determined by the highest address of these boxes. So if we had 15 zones, for instance, on a VAV system, zone number 15 would be the highest one that we'd make in the linkage master. Everybody else below would have to be addressed sequentially on that system. So we'd have to go 14 to 13 to 12, 11 to 10, all that way down there. So we tell the linkage master not only that he's the guy who's going to do this, we tell him how many zones to look for. So there might be more than one system on any CCS. So he's told to look at 15 different addresses, including himself. And then we tell him, what, where is your air source? Where is he located? And then he gets, so he knows that he delivers the information from the 15 zones up to the air source that might be at say bus zero on only 101 so we'll stop one. So he gives them all the information for temperature, gives them all the information for occupancy, and he also might give them information in IAQ or into air quality. And the rooftop or the air source will respond to the information and will tell people. So no longer do you have the rooftop unit telling the zones what it could do, you have now the zoning system telling the rooftop what it do. Hey Dan. Yeah. We had a few folks uh, say that the sound was getting a little bit harder to hear. I know part of it's because you have the same disease I have, which is you talk super fast. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe we can get you to slow down a little bit uh, so we can hear it a little bit better. Uh, we did also have a technical okay. question as well. Uh, Dwayne asked if you could repeat uh, how to clean buttons with the eraser again. Oh, sure. You're talking. It was like five minutes ago. He typed that in. It was a while back. 
okay? You said something about exactly. clicking buttons off with an eraser. I think it was on the. Uh, right here. Okay. Yeah. This, this thing right, this screen right here. Yeah. Um, what you do is you take. You can see. Can you see my mouse? Yes, we can see your mouse. Okay. So if you take the face of the comfort link off of here, you'll expose just the plate of the of the of, of the comfort link display. You can peel that off. That's actually kind of a full uh, a rubberish, a soft rubber kind of thing. You peel that off, and on the back of it there, these are actually more like just rubber. Um, buttons that are on here that go that press up against the, um, the, the printer circuit board behind it. So if you take an eraser, you can do both the buttons on here where they come in there. You can't miss them, and you can do a little bit on the uh, on the board itself. That has worked in about a third of the time. I'm getting just a pretty new life into these cover there. It's pretty simple to do. Once you get the screws out, you'll feel this thing just peels off. You can erase it, you know, clean up as best you can, put it back on, and hope for the best. Awesome, that answered his question, thank you. Okay. I'll go a little slower here. Okay. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> so um, so that's VAB. Again, VAB is a system controller where it says, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna take the average space temperature and compare that to the average heating and cooling set points and let the air source deal with that because they're talking mainly on larger, larger buildings or larger systems. When you get to the smaller ones, you heard the word VBT before, variable volume, variable temperature. Now we come to the same sort of thing, but now these are more for smaller systems that have constant volume, heating, and cooling units. And the unique thing about this is that no longer are we taking any more averages on this thing, but that any one of these zones can tell this rooftop unit to go to heating mode or to go to cooling mode. So since all the zones are tied together, we operate as a system. So when the unit is in a heating mode and other zones don't need that heat, they will close off to prevent their system from overheating. Or they may take a partial amount of that heat, they don't need a full blast of it. And then if someone else needs cooling, they'll wait his turn, and once we're out of the heating mode, we'll put the unit into a cooling mode, and then in the, in the zones will respond accordingly like that. So the system is operating on that kind of, a, of, of uh, information all the time, so that the unit's not doing two things at once. You can also have supplemental heat in a DVP system, but most of them do not. You just simply run by telling the unit what to do, and the unit will respond to the needs of the zone. This controller looks a lot like the VAD controller, with the exception that it has no pressure sensors. It is pressure dependent, which means that it does not know how much air is coming down the duct. In sense, it should modulate its damper based upon the deviations of set point. So the farther away you are from set point, the wider the damper will open up to allow more or less air into the space. Okay. Um, unlike the VAV controller, which has two stages of heat available built right into the, into, the, into the main baseboard, if you need any auxiliary heat for this, for a fan on a fan box or uh, on some sort of supplemental heat like duct heat, you have to have a separate board go into it called a daughter board that plugs into it and that gives you extra heat output because most of these systems do not use any kind of auxiliary heat. So we stand it like that. It's still using the same space sensor and whatnot, and it's built to do CO2 or demand control ventilation so that we can tell the rooftop unit to open up its damper further for more outside air or open up the zone damper to allow more air into the space in conditions where we might have uh, a build of a heater. The inputs are fairly the same, except for we do not have CFM. Okay. One thing that's unique about most DVT systems is that since these dampers can open and close freely, like any VAV damper can, but we have nothing in the duct here, to, to, or nothing in the rooftop unit to control static pressure like we would on a VAV system, which might have a switch driver or something like that. Most of these um, systems will have a bypass damper. The bypass damper job is for static pressure. He, he looks at the static pressure in the ductwork. And as it builds up, we will let the damper open up. That goes from supply to return. Sometimes the supply jumps into the plenum. Sometimes the damper visits the supply and return. And we told people never do that right here, but it always did. So a lot of times it sits right here in the drop to do supply and return. So as the pressure builds up here, we just put the air to the rooftop unit because his fan is a single speed fan that puts about the same amount of air all the time. The bypass controller has a pressure sensor in it. As a damper motor, 
does not do anything with space temperature control, but will do immediate air temperature protecting. As you might guess, if you're short cycling the air from supply to return, as the air in that duct is in a heating mode, you put it very, very warm air back on the return, or you get some very, very cold air back in the return, which then causes the unit to have some problems if it doesn't take care of that. So the bypass camera has some built-in things to try to prevent that from happening. So a typical system looks like this, where you have 24 volts go into it, you have a space sensor, you have your various dampers on here, and you have your bypass controller um, that will dump the air in it. All of this will talk back to some sort of an air source. And in most cases on this air source, we're going to talk to a Camaro. But the other part of this thing is most of you have seen, and if you haven't, um, you will someday, it's called the system pilot. I think if anybody has come across a system pilot in the last couple of years, he doesn't know it, he's probably talked to me or one of our people in there because it's a very confusing thing. But most of the systems we sold with DVT on the CCN side had one of these as their interface. This was the way of the owner of setting the time program, of setting the schedules, um, setting the set points and whatnot within the, within the system. So we had to have something in there that would allow the owner interface. And since a lot of these systems were smaller, the system pilot was their, was their go-to device. It's a very, very frustrating device to use, but if you get under understand how to use it, it lets you do what you need to do to make the system work. So it is using the time broadcaster because he has a time clock angle. He, he can attach himself to one device at a time. He has no memory of his own, so he doesn't know what the device did before. So every time you attach, you have to upload that particular device and do it. He doesn't have very, very little system uh, capabilities, but it has a little bit. But um, but it was our standard way of communicating to the, B, the BDT system. So again, if you never come across one, you said, You'll probably give us a call. Once you get used to it, it's really not a bad device, but again, it's, it's frustrating the first time you see it. The air source on a majority of the DVT systems have what they call a Premier Link. Premier Link was something that could be factory mounted <laughs> on standard heating cooling units, or it could be field mounted. The Premier Link looked like this. Um, it has a series of Thermal blocks on here where they had pigtails came out of it. This is how you attach your space temperature sensors, supplier temperature sensors, IAQ sensors on this side of it. And on the bottom side over here was your output. Your heat one, heat two, cool one, cool two fan. And it had a third output over here that can be used for a third stage of heat or a reversing valve with a heat pump, or can use it for an exhaust gas. Okay. It also had an output here for a 4 to 20 milliamp output that could be used to drive a damper mill. Economizing it. For those of you who know, you cannot get a damper economizing motor that 4 to 20 milliamp or very, very rare. But if you want, you can put a 500 ohm resistor across those two terminals and convert the 4 to 20 milliamp to 2 to 10 volts with the standard Honeywell and Benino and Keynes motor will run. So that's how we controlled our economy. The communication bus plugs into here and power into here. But this is our standard bread and butter everyday air source interface for most of our DVT systems. Again, it could be factory mounted or it could be field mounted. It does not have it, it does not have a clock that's for kind of day broadcasting. That's why we added a system pilot on the thing. But it certainly would, would handle the things on a standard space sensor in a standalone mode. Um, supplier temperature, with auxiliary functions like fan status. And, and those kind of things you put onto it outside air changeover. They said it has two modes of operation, but 99.9% of the time it just ran in the CCM mode. And the CCM mode means that it was standalone, it had its own space temperature sensor and supplier temperature. But you could, if you had an old thermostat and you wanted to just add to a CCM, you could put the thermostat into here, if they like it for some reason. And use the thermostat input to control the output of this. It's kind of redundant and most of the time, like I said, very, very weird. So we always use this thing in a CCN. The other thing I want to bring about is some of these things. And if you just saw that screen and you cringe, you, 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 uh, you've been around for a while. Um, these are our generation three or 33 CF set um, back in the 90s. This was our bread and butter, and we sold a ton of these. For those really old back in the days, these things also look like what they call the Parker system. 
The Parker Trophy was the first system carrier head in conjunction with Parker Electronics that did do a VDT system, the first variable volume, variable temperature system out there. Those did not talk CCN, had its own proprietary bus on its own, but you know, they had a little rotary switch on the east side of here, and we sold the hell out of these things. We put carrier on the map as far as carrier control board. When Carrier took over full uh, bore on Parker Electronics, they converted the same system over to CCN to now the same hardware that was used on VDT system in Parker was now converted to CCN. So they used the same damper motors, the same damper sensors, but they just converted the boards inside of here to Carrier Company. So again, there's a lot of these out there, but they have been obsolete since 2000. So there's not a lot of parts there. So if you need, if you run into one of these things, and I'll talk about a little bit on the end of it here, it may be time to tell the owner to consider um, thinking about updating because there's really nothing we can do as far as uh, maintaining these things any longer. I mean, there's a ton of parts on eBay and things you can get going. The beauty of these things was that you did not need a computer. All the intelligence is in the thermostat. This is one of the last systems that did that. Now everything, all the intelligence is up in the ceiling and the damper themselves. But on here, the communication bus is brought in and out of the thermostat. And so all programming can be done from the display. You never needed a computer to program. That's why they were popular, they worked, they lasted, and there's still a lot of money. So um, just to keep in mind that they're there, they will talk on the CCN like anything else. They have the same rules, and uh, they operate just fine while operating with VBT and VBU systems in the same communication. Other controllers you may run into. Um, the fan coil controller is another application specific controller that was used a lot, especially in schools and those kind of things where you had fan coils or unit vents that required a controller in each one of these things. So we could do two and four plant. We had multiple speed fan control, um, did uh, modulating with two position heating and cooling. And I want to take a second here when we say modulating on any of these application specific controllers. We do not have any analog output on this on these boards per se. That's true the DAV, the VDT, or the fan club board. There is no modulating output. What they do is they call it they do a floating output for modulating. That means they pulse the damper open and they excuse them. Pulse the blow down open when they want more heat and pulse it closed when they want less heat. So in effect it is modulating but it's pulsing uh, and, and by, by spiking the voltage uh, to the open or to the close that anyone at a time and then in between that it lets it rest and the valve sit for its closure. That's the modulation part. But there are clearly no analog outputs on any report. Again, these things take the same space temperature sensors and whatnot that the other one do to do IAQ like the like the uh like the DAV and DDT controls can do. So these space sensors are pretty common and can be universal throughout all the things we talked about so far. The output from the fan coil controller has a relay board that gives us the three speeds of fan, plus again the modulating to tri state or DX tooling, same thing for electric. Other systems you may run into, we have a, a chiller visor out there. If you had a series of multiple carrier chillers, CCN chillers, you may find a chiller system visor, a chiller visor. Out there that would uh, would coordinate the operation of these three chillers or four chillers or five chillers. Um, what happened is we get both the eight chillers. Um, this thing will take compile all the information and talk CCM these things and give you the uh, the best way to run these chillers, the most efficient way to keep the uh, the, uh, the the chill water at the temperature required and still maintain the uh, the, the optimal flow of the machine. This would also normally have what they call a lid in here, a local interface device that was unique only to chillers. Um, this is going to get you stop, but it's, a, it's an interface that sits on the chiller bus, on the CCN, and it talk not only to the chiller, but can also talk to other CCN devices, but mainly it was done so you could talk to multiple chillers from one spot without a PC or a public device on it. Hey, Dan? Yeah. So that chiller visor hardware and obviously the next screen you're about to show that it looks the same visually how can they tell the difference between those those white modules what their jobs are um good question um usually they'll, they'll put something on there that will that'll identify them by a part number 
you know, the part number has to be cross reference over to what it is. It, it won't say chiller visor on there. It won't say it won't say comfort controller or like that. Usually, you have to um, look at the part number by itself, like a CES number, and they cross reference it over. That was one of the things that was always hard to tell uh, what you actually have. Um, so you're right. I, there's there's no marking as to say that tells you what it is. But they use the same hardware platform for about four or five different modules. The chiller advisor being one. Um, the chiller system manager was the other one. Uh, they use the same thing. It's, it's the same as the chiller advisor, only they use non CCN devices. So it would it would operate to a point where we talk to Carrier, your train, chiller, plate. I mean, any of the various brands and we talk non CCN of these things, but still optimize the chiller operation. <clears throat> Much like a chiller advisor would do. Coordinate the pump with the chiller and the number of machines you need to, make, to maintain water tank. Um, some of the other modules we had that, that are very common, these are again a little bit older, but um, the repeater were used on, on something that we needed to convert a system that had a long bus, anything over a thousand feet would need a repeater. The common repeaters looked like this before. But now we've added these things from BNB Electronics. Um, these are the repeaters we try mostly now, anything from about 2000 all the way up, have these repeaters built into them. Um, I mentioned this thing because if your building ever gets struck by lightning and it has a repeater on it, these were the weakest link. These little black boxes in the corner right here from BNB Electronics, they work great, they're very efficient, but they did have a very, very weak fuse when it came to, to voltage spikes. So if you're going to build a hit by lightning and half the bus is down or a portion of it down or put the whole thing down and it has one of these things down, this is where I'd go first. These other devices are old, old devices that we used to tie the interface into our from our computer when we had the DOS-based computers. This is our way to talk to our system from a phone jack into a CCN and these are NAMs and, and other devices from computers. You probably won't see many of those. Our, our bridge module, Looks again like our comfort controller, and the same platform uh, of uh, hardware you see. It does not have any input output terminals on here, but this is the guy that you wire into bus zero, you give it an address, and it creates that secondary bus. And again, this secondary bus that can have 239 devices that it can talk to and still talk to on the main CCN. It's a bridge apart segregating uh, devices from the main bus. A data collection module was something that we used pre IVU uh, that needed, if you needed to do trends or you didn't do data history, uh, you'd have to have a separate module on the CCN to do that. There's nothing built in with it. Didn't. This data collection module was pretty popular uh, um, before IVU came out, and I'll talk about IVU in a little bit. Um, but he would gather information from various points assigned to it and keep that over history. He was also able to transfer data from one machine to another. So if you needed the, uh, the space temperature down from one rooftop and go over to another rooftop, this guy would also perform more duties. Before 2000, we had a series of these 8088 processes that did all the things we talked about before. This was our line of controllers that would come out that would, up, that would do all the CCN functions, the, basically the non-programmable CCN functions, our repeater, our bridges, this is our phone line interface. We had tenant billing, we had load shed. We had a lot of things going on. And for the 90s, this was a pretty complete system that would, that would let billing owners and operators manage their billing quite effectively. All of these things are pretty well done, except for maybe this terminal system manager we're talking about. But the, but the first thing I want to do is, again, this is an 8088 process. When you see an 8088 process, you know that it is a RAM device. And it and thus needs to be backed up with power. If it loses power, it has to have a battery in it right here that would hold up the program in case it loses power. If it loses power and the battery is dead, this becomes dumb. And by dumb, I mean it doesn't know anything. So again, the battery is the same one. It's a 3.6 volt double A lithium non-rechargeable battery, the same one that we used in the on the, on the chiller module. Um, it, Goes in the same compartment down here. It has to be replaced when the power is on the module. And the way you tell them these things, if it's dumb or not, if you walk in here and there's a green light right here, 
the green light right here. Both of those green lights are on solid. When you see this module, it's probably dead and it needs to be reprogrammed. Reprogramming has to be done through a carrier distributor of some sort or carrier uh, fully owned, uh, like uh, carrier uh, commercial service. Um, so there are ways of getting it back into it, but the best way to ensure that doesn't happen is to change these batteries. Again, the only time you're going to see these things now are most likely is these terminal system managers at TSM. The TSM was carriers first track at digital air volume, we call it DAB. We sold a lot of them, and there's still a lot of them functioning today. Um, they were the they were the first real um, communication that linked the manufacturer's rooftop unit their hardware to the manufacturer's control system. This was our first grab at a large DAB system. And what it, what was unique about it is that all the brains are inside this module. The VAB boxes have a, what they call a terminal control unit downstream. That terminal control unit just talked to this guy back and forth about once a minute. We'd talk to each other. This would compile the information. we send the linkage data up to the rooftop unit or the air source, whatever it would be. So we'd talk continually back and forth between all the VAB boxes. It would tell the VAB box to open or close, bring out heat, don't bring out heat. All the information or all the brain functioning was done inside of the CSM. Okay. So there are still quite a few of these things out there. And I want to be aware of them that, that they are still working, they're still fine, but we do have that value. Another module that we've used up until recently was our uh, uh, Tellink. The Tellink job was to allow full line interface to a standard CCN system so we could dial into a system via phone from service to a building supervisor and talk to that building to go. These were very, very popular. They're very, very efficient. The only problem is nobody talks via phone lines anymore because they use an analog modem, and all phone systems have now gone to MSI, uh, voice over IP. So an analog modem no longer works. These things no longer perform a function. They did have one thing, though, that we talked about before that it may do, that you may need it to be plugged into, and that its own system function was alarm technology. So it could be that this guy was the alarm acknowledger for the system, and by unplugging it, you would leave the system vulnerable to having no alarm acknowledger and it can, it can cause all kinds of communication problems. So if, you, if, you look, if it's doing no harm, I would say it didn't plug in. Those are our standard functioning modules, application specific kind of controllers. There is a series of programmable controllers that Carrier has that are very powerful. That allows you to tie the auxiliary function of the non carrier devices into the CCM and make the, make the building uh, controls complete. The first one is the CC1600. You'll see they look very similar to each other, except the 1600 had non removable terminals, was standard, was eight in, eight out, not expandable, did have some, did have some power of a, of a custom programming language, but your input and output were limited. I never used them. I never liked them. <laughs> I always went to the carrier um, comfort controller, the CC6400. This was my bread and butter controller for many, many years and still is. It's my favorite controller. I believe in this thing. It, it does anything I've ever needed to do for any building function. It has eight, in, eight ins and eight outs per module. It's standable at the 64 points. You can have 32 ins and 32 outs. The inputs and outputs are all what they call universal. That means that a universal input could be a temperature or a voltage or a milliamp, and the same with the output. It could be a discrete output or binary, you know, open source kind of thing, or it could be a 4 to 20 milliamp or a 2 to 10. So, uh, so all the inputs and all the outputs are universal. Um, again, we can expand it up to 64 points. And had a custom language called BEST that we could program this thing. So besides the standard logarithms that come with it, we could we could create our own with the BEST program and make the same work to the to the building owners again. The I/O modules look very much like the comfort controller itself, although it only talks to back to the comfort controller. They're pretty much a dumb module that just provides information back to the comfort controller on, on the input and output. But they can be remotely monitored away. So if you had air handlers in different areas of the building, a lot of times you'd see one of these input output modules 
filter the leak, uh, the wiring starts to make wiring a lot easier. So this thing may have a number of points to it, but the IO module may or may not be next to it. So you have to, you have to determine that by, uh, by, uh, by the bus. The bus that runs between here and the comfort controller is called the IO bus. It is not on the standard CCN bus per se, so I cannot plug my CCN interface, service or whatever, into an I.O. module and talk to the system. It only will talk back to the company. The other popular controller we have is called the Universal Controller. This was something that came out in the late 90s and has been very, very popular and very useful. Um, it's not expandable. It's eight ins and eight outs, but again, they're universal. Outdoor rated. It does not have a custom programming language, but it has several Standard logarithms that will let you do the other applications in the system. You can control boilers with this, you can control pumps with this, you can control lighting with this, you can control exhaust tanks, those kind of things, cabinet meters, meter meters, all those auxiliary functions that you do. The nice thing about this one is that it was lower cost, and you can put these things along the area and, and, and handle all the exhaust tanks, all the auxiliary meters or whatever from uh, a, a location close to where these things are located. So the wiring was, a, was reduced. Very, very popular, very, very, um, very, very universal how it works. So those are the typical controllers you'll see on any CCN bus. Um, again, all of it tied together and doesn't need any kind of front end in order to operate. Once in program and told what to do, they'll operate standalone but efficiently as a system or whatever without any kind of interface. But the beauty of any DDC system is that you can also then now see that thing and talk to that thing and program that thing remotely or on site from a PC or some device that lets you do this same wholesale. And that's what I kind of want to go to now is our basic user interfaces that we have on the system. The most common thing we have for any service technician or any control person or whatever is called a network service tool. Network service tool nowadays looks like this. It has a USB connection that goes into your computer. It has two ways of talking on the CCN. It has a standard plug right here that goes the red, white, black that a standard CCN bus would have in and out. Or it has a phone jack. A couple of things. If you're using a phone jack to communicate from this into one of our systems, then you'll see that all the CCN devices now have this little phone plug down here where it are located on the device. Whether it's a VAD box, a VDT box, whether it's a fan coil. As a comfort controller, they have this little plug that you can plug your phone line into it to attach your service tool into it from just a four wire phone cord. But you have to make sure that it is a four wire cord and that it's a and it's a, that, the, that the wires are opposite on the, on the plug itself. Some companies use a straight through, I will mention the name of the train on their system. That means you know it goes red to red, white to white on, on their phone cord. We use a standard phone cord, which is uh, which is opposite. If you hold the two plugs together, the wire colors on that plug should be opposite. But if you're using the standard one that was used on all, all the plugs we have. But that allows you now to plug here directly in the controller and talk to the whole system to your one location. This thing allows you to do best programming. It allows you to talk to the whole CCN from one spot. It allows you to program. It allows you to upgrade. It even has a program called Field Order, which allows you to update the controller to the latest version. Okay. One thing I want to say about service tool and about talking to carrier CCN in general, one of the one of the best things and most unique things about carrier comfort network was that it's the same today as it was before. So I can take this 2020 piece of service tool and I can plug it into a 1990 chiller. And I can talk to it. But I can even take the 1990 software that was talking to that chiller which is way back then and plug it in a 2020 chiller or rooftop, and I can talk to it. The way carrier comfort network has talked to every change in the whole time it's been alive. So no matter what we're using to interface to it, it will talk on the CCM. Okay. Some of the older versions of this was we had comfort view which was our standard building operator on most large buildings and systems that had B and whatnot. It was a graphic interface. It resided on one PC. 
that PC was physically connected to the communication bus, but allows you to interface, program, and do things graphically from the one location. And it would do all the CCM from one spot. Hey, Dan, we did have a question. Yeah. Uh, the question is from Martin. He's asking if you can pull the best plus plus program from an existing controller. Yes. Without, without getting terribly technical, yes. Um, when you go into a comfort controller or you go into a, uh, a basically a comfort controller and you want to upload it, you get all the points and all the logarithms and whatnot, but you do not get the best plus plus programs that are built inside of that controller. For that, you have to go to the best plus plus um, icon on the, on the server tool itself. You have to select the comfort controller you're talking to. And then you have to do a couple of steps that are uh, a little confusing, but um, they're, they're spelled out for you in, in certain um, manuals. You have to go to there, you have to put in the program, and you interrogate that particular controller to tell you what the programs are, and then you can load them up program by program back up onto your screen and then save them onto your database. But it's a separate function than get uploading the controller from the software side. You have to do the best separately. And it has to be in the best plus plus environment from the icon on the service tool. And a lot of controllers won't even have best plus plus programs in them. That was just if somebody did something custom. So half the jobs will have it and half the jobs won't have it. Well, they only reside in the comfort control. That's the only thing that can talk best plus plus. Or that can create a plus a best program. It can transfer that data to other controllers, but that, that controller is, does not have the program in it. It only gets the information sent to it from the comfort control. So the comfort controller was the only guy, and the 1600 had it also, that can create a best program. So that's the only time you ever going to even upload it from one of those controls. What about a FID? What's that? I said, what about a FID? <laughs> you do it for your dungeon job, though. You do it for Yeah. That was best plus, though. Not plus plus. So, yeah. The other thing about the best plus plus program is when you extract them from the controller, you're just going to get the raw code. You're not going to get any of the programmer's helpful notes, assuming the programmer even made notes like some of us did and some of us didn't. Um, but if you upload yeah. it from the controller, it's just going to be the raw code and, and there'd be no notes explaining how the code was supposed to work and what it was supposed to do. So it's a little bit challenging, as with anything that's custom. Right. Unless you type the REM thing, then that would come up to it also. Anything written in the line code will come up when you upload the best program from the controller. So if you did a, you did a couple of remarks or did some of that, then Mark, like you said, you were going to do that will come up, no problem. But if every, every, like any kind of custom programming, it's up to the individual how they, how they thought on how to do it. There's always more than one way to, to, to put a control program in. So, um, but usually if you understand the language, it's pretty self-explanatory. Is there any way but, for, uh, for average Joe Tech to know if the comfort controller he's working with, in fact, has best plus plus programs in it? Um, the easiest way to do it is just by checking without having to do anything is go to the best plus plus icon, select the comfort controller from the drop down menu, and then go in there and just do best sources. It'll just list any program that that controller might have in it, any, any best program that that controller has built in it. Well, I'll tell you what it is really like that, but it will tell you, it will list them out for you. So then you know if you're dealing with something that has to be uploaded separately from the database. And it probably wouldn't hurt to back those up as you guys are doing service work on buildings. It wouldn't hurt to get those backups and store them on your computer because someday that controller is going to go down for some reason and you don't want to program it from scratch. You'd rather have the backup. Correct. Yeah, because when you upload the controller and get the database from it, you do not get the best program automatically. It has to be, it has to be a separate effort to do that. Okay. So that's service tool. And again, if, if, if anybody wants, and we have enough people, we would, we would do a class just on service tool. They'll allow you to tell you and, and get your way around these various controllers and how to do exactly that, you know, how to get the best program out of there, how to upload controllers, how to do all the things you need to do to make your service still work for you. Again, with anything carrier-wise, one thing I like about it is you get the same program I get. You don't, there's nothing fancy about, I mean, we don't get anything uh, based on that carrier can do that you guys 
can't do in the field. When you buy the service tool, you're buying the full blown carrier software that I have. And you can do all the things that you need to do or want to do on a system the same as any carrier program would do. So you have full power with anything like that. And the same is true of our backend system. So um, the ability will be there. And anybody who wants to learn how to do it and whatnot, it's certainly something we can, we can talk about. I can, I can talk about it forever. Um, in the old days, we had, like I said, the PCs that had Comfort to you or Big Brother Comfort Works. Comfort Works was one that had been a lot uh, a lot larger than uh, multiple systems for college campuses, you know, medical complex, those kind of things, but not the Comfort Works software, which is a way for tying in multiple buildings uh, together on one computer. But mainly Comfort View was a bread and butter for a building order to have on its site. It gave them the ability to see things graphically, to change and enter time programs, and, and, and monitor that. Also a lot. Nowadays, um, we've changed our, our, our bridges that are hardwired out of the bus, and we had to go to do what they call Ethernet bridges. <clears throat> Ethernet gateway was a way for us to replace the uh, the ones that are hardwired on bus zero to something that runs over the internet and allows you to tie in multiple buildings to the same CCN or multiple areas in the building. Not only have to hardware it now to get over to the bridge, but actually have an internet bridge that would do the same thing. So I'm placing that big piece of hardware here, this internet bridge right here would be address at 075, like anything else on, uh, on, on the CCN, it's a bridge that's on the primary bus, but now it creates a secondary bus that's hardware. So this is internet wise, this is hardware. That's what it is, but it creates bus 75, just like it would have been a, a bridge tied on the, on the bus. Physically. Other devices that make me cringe, um, the CCN web, which was Carrier's first attempt to get an embedded web server to talk to the same, not only locally now, from a computer that was on site, but now you could talk to the system from anywhere over the internet, okay? This was a, this was a unique device. It was the first attempt to do, um, to do that. It was still Carrier at the time. Um, the reason Carrier purchased Automated Logic back in 2007 and six was to replace these things with some more powerful web servers and web browsers and get into the back end world. But this was Carrier's first attempt at this. Um, if they're, Ryan sold a lot of them, unfortunately. And every time I mention these things, we're going to call on them, but there's still quite a few of these out there. They're very, they're kind of crude, but they allowed you to do bus scans. They allowed you to see system data. They allowed you to manage alarms and had some basic graphics in them that allow people to be able to see things, you know, from the whole building standpoint, like building and those kind of things from one spot. I view now, though, is, is the thing that we've um, set our standard on as far as how to communicate to the carrier system. Um, this is a full blown web server itself, an embedded web server that sits on the internet of the various customers and allows you now access via any computer as long as they're tied into their internet. Okay, if the customer allows this or, and allows this IP address to be outside of their building, you can get to the from anywhere in the world. Obviously, they can't have their own website. It is its own unique website dedicated to that, to that particular building. They were originally came out with two versions of iView. There was the CCN version and there was the backend or open version. Okay, those are versions 4.2 for CCN and 5.1 for backend. When, when we upgraded it a few years ago to IV 6.0, it allowed you to talk CCN and carry your backup from the same IV, which is a huge step forward in integrating these systems. Um, so now the IV still comes in basically three flavors. The IV standard, which is its own box, it's an embedded web server, the physical box that sits in the customer's internet. Has seven days of trending, but it will do 750 devices. Uh, has the custom graphics, has the alarming, has the, has the output for the alarm to uh, the email them, or if you set them up on a set. The iView Plus was the next step up. It's still the same physical looking box that sits on their site. It, it gives you 60 days of trending now. So it extended the database for the trending side of it, but it also allows you integration to third party devices. So if you have a system that as normally would be carrier CCM or carrier backup, 
but now you want to assign some frequency drive or you want to assign a form chiller or a form boiler system or something and you want them to program, get the points from them, be able to program and, and, and be able to send them data, you need the IB plus. That gave the ability to third party integration. The last one um, is the IB Pro. The IB Pro is a piece of software you buy that resides on the customer's uh, PC of some sort, their server. Whether you create your own server from a, a standalone PC or you get a piece of their server, in the case of a medical facility or college campus or a bank, they give you a piece of their server uh, uh, called a virtual server. The software resides on there and now you've, up, you've obtained the ability to do unlimited training. And you have the integration built right into it. The IV Pro can be as small as an eight zone system or as large as an unlimited system. It comes in about four different flavors. Either it's an eight zone or 16 and a 32, and then you jump up to the 750, and then you go to the unlimited. But the IV Pro gives you some also ability to do some add ons for weather reporting and those kind of things that the other ones don't have. So it's a little more powerful than the uh, standard of the plus, but again, it's on somebody else's hardware. So you have to provide that or the customer has to provide that hardware. And it's responsible for you. The IDU system essentially takes the place of all four of these top devices and replaces them with one device. So it does the, the graphic interface from anywhere. It has the remote capability to come in from outside. It has the web ability to do it from the internet. And it has the ability to do trending and, and, uh, and logging of that. Okay, it talks to all the standard carrier controllers, all the way down from the generation 333 CS, all the way up to the standard new chillers and whatnot, and everything in between. Each one of these carrier devices has a unique graphic built into it. So when you scan it from the ID, the graphic is already built in with the carrier. Okay, so if you see perfect graphics like this, this would be a premier link or something like that. Anything that's that is application specific again have a carrier ID graphic built in. But it also has the ability to create custom graphics and custom reporting. So now you can come let this thing go on a standard one, and you can do things like report alarms over, over the internet to voicemail or to the texting or to emails. So you have now you have an alarm management system that works really, really well on this system to the side end of internet anyways. You can do advanced reporting for some add-ons for, for uh, dumping data in. Some medical facilities require certain data to be dumped every 30 days for critical rooms, those kind of things for pressure or for temperatures or things like that. We sense the IV has the ability to do that. The equipment summaries, advanced, advanced uh, trend samples, all that stuff is built right into the IV. So it's a very powerful machine. It's simple to install. It connects to their system on a CCM side. You have a, a USB plug out of the back that connects to the bus like any other device on the bus, or connect over a, uh, a router, which is a, a, an internet device. You scan the devices that are on the bus. You, you manage them to where you want to be so it's, it's uh, easy for the customer to use these things. And then you set it up with, with the custom graphics if you want for floor plans and, and borders or something that's non CCM. Very, very easy to use, very, very powerful, very good for the customer to be able to see his building as a whole and be able to judge things right away without having to interrogate step by step by step. Okay. Um, the idea now, we talked about being CCM, being proprietary bus, being something that's been around since the early 90s and tried to throw and I hope it lasts forever. But as they talk about proprietary buses and proprietary equipment, what really happens is, is that building owners and engineers are demanding something more open, something that other people can talk in the same language. The industry has settled on backend, I think because Ashray wrote the, wrote the line for backend. So the communication scheme now for most every uh, HVAC building out there now is backend. That's the preferred protocol that people use. Carrier has a complete backnet line, including DAB, DDT, even uh, programmable controllers, and even the interface to other carrier devices like large chillers and rooftop. So that'll operate by itself. The CCM side over here, still a CCN is viable. 
But the problem with the CCN is that it's not necessarily going away because, like I said before, chiller and rooftops and whatnot are native CCN. Disney is their largest customer. They buy a lot of CCN yet, and they're still keeping it alive. But the price of a controller has gone up quite a bit. In fact, now the price of a CCN controller for a VAD box is almost double the price of a vector controller doing the same thing. So you can see the problem here. If people want to start expanding or adding on to their CCN system, it becomes a, a price, a price issue. So as you never thought you heard from me, but it may be beneficial if someone wants to, and they have an idea, to be able to, if they want to add on different systems, they want to add on controllers or, or you know, buildings and whatnot, to go to the back that route, because it only takes a couple of these controllers to make up the price of this new router that's, that pops on the back that the same um, the same ID that the CCN one is talking about. So those are things to consider as you go forward with, with the system. Um, but the beauty of it is that both of these systems will talk together. And if you know the protocol on how to talk to a CCN device, which I'll get into in a second for a little bit, the same kind of um, uh, terminology is used on the backend side. It's not quite as straightforward to use as it is on the CCN side. But if you learn the CCN protocol, you learn the CCN way of talking and communicating and programming, the same will apply to the backend side. So it is a pretty, pretty good smooth transition. But again, both of these systems can talk to the same idea. And again, if you want to add third party devices, they even back at Modbus and Lawnmark, you can put these links in that will talk third party integration. So all this is tied into one uh, particular system. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh pretty universal way to go. So any questions on that? Now you have time to get in some software or uh, we do, yeah. You guys can type questions in if you have them. In the meantime, uh, Dan's going to pull up a little demo on his computer um, to show you what some of this stuff looks like. So go ahead and type stuff in as you think of it, and I'll uh, I'll ask the questions to Dan. Okay. I got about 10 minutes to go, so I'm just going to give you a basic overview of some software that you go onto a, onto a carrier cover network. I'm going to load up my service tool program. Okay, when you launch service tool, any job you've seen in the past, like you see on my system, you can see that right. Real quick, real quick, Dan. Uh, for you guys yeah. watching, uh, we can't really make things bigger with this, but on your guys' screen, you can go to the full screen view on go to go to webinar. So hit that full screen view so you can see it as best as possible. Go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Okay. So once I launch service tool from the connection manager point, you'll see any job that I've talked to before comes up on the system. So as you can see, I've been doing this for quite a while and a few jobs that I've talked to over the course of time. Um, but what you can do from here is the first thing you want to do is you want to get the job you want to attach to and you want to connect to it. I can either double click on it or I can go to this little arrow up there and I connect to the job that I want to talk to. Once it's talked to, that's in here. Now I can do my best program if I wanted to. It's on this particular part or I can go to the individual device itself. There you go, why didn't talk it? Different screen, sorry about that. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yep, we can so see one screen. Second. Yep, class 2020. Okay, so what I did is I have a couple controllers in my office here. So I've, I've got my own little basic CCN system here. The first thing I want to make sure you know is that when you talk to any CCN device, I don't care if it's a 1980 or 90 device or a 2020 device, <clears throat> whenever you talk to a device on a CCN, it has a little plus sign on here, you drop down. These are the six things that you will see on every one of these devices. Okay. If you know what these things mean, these, these particular tables mean, you can talk to a VAV box, a chiller, a rooftop unit, or any other device that carries CCN. Is not okay. So if it's if you get nothing else out of this thing when you talk to it from a computer from service tool, this is what you want to see. Again, it's true. I don't care if you're talking on a DOS based machine, or you're talking on Comfort Works or Comfort View, or you're talking on service tool. These are the displays you get. And, and so I don't care if this is a VAD box. If I drop down on the rooftop unit, same six up here. Okay. Now 
On a large size thing, you may have another one here that says, that'll, that'll say alarm history. And some controllers don't have the servicing on it, but basically these are what you're going to see for every CCM device that you have. And I want to kind of go over them a little bit for you, but this is critical. Um, status and maintenance are displayed. Okay, that means this is live data that comes back in from the device into the screen. So if I click on the status display, um, over here I see I may have one or more point screens. If it's a VAD box, I only have one because all the points that we're looking at will be contained in one screen. But if it's a chiller, I may have seven or eight of these um, uh, static screens, one for each compressor, and it, it kind of segregates down to the various areas. So you're not looking and scrolling page after page after page to try to find the information you want. It's 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 going to get by by various screens. So you may have one or more of these. But if I double click on the point screen here, now this is live data that comes back from my controller onto the screen. Okay. Doesn't tell me how to program it, doesn't tell me it just tells me what's going on inside of this machine. And you can see that it's live data. You can see it, but if you watch my space temperature up here. If I'm warm blood, that thing should rise when I'm holding out of the space temperature. So you can see about every five seconds or so it updates the screen and gives you the data that you're looking for. Okay. Anything that's dark can be forced. So if I wanted to say my space temperature is something else, I can double click on it or hit the force arrow. I can type something into it. Hit force. And now you see what I typed into it is what it is. And let me tell you, it's going to stay there until I release that force. So be careful when you force something. I can't tell you how many times people want more heat in the space so they tell the space temperature is really warm in it. But it's a little more cooling in it, so it felt really cold in there, and the opposite occurs. But when you do force something, you can tell right away under the force column, I've got the word service here, meaning someone from service tool has forced that force. It gives you an indication that something that's telling that point what to do that isn't what that point normally would be. Okay? So those are nice. When you look at a device and you see something, and I look at this force column, because chances are if you're called to a job that's having problems, and you have an operator on there who's got some sort of interface to it, a lot of guys just can't help themselves and they force things all over the place and you'll see this whole column is loaded with forces. You start with like releasing those forces and all I did is go there and click on the lightning bolt with a line for it and it goes back to normal. Okay, so that's the status display. The maintenance display is very much like it, okay, but now this is what really um, more information what the controller is is calculating what other things are telling you what to do as far as making this program work and what's going on. So if I click on the maintenance display, for instance, now I get a few more tables over here. So if I go into the uh, just the standard maintenance table over here, again, this is live data. So what it will tell me things like is what is my set point offset here? In other words, where's my slide going? When we see the word master reference, this will actually tell me what the set points that the unit is looking at the control to. That is the basic set point plus or minus the slide bar. Okay. It'll tell me if I have a submaster reference for the heat, which would be where is my discharge air temperature trying to obtain and keep the space satisfied. So you can see in my occupied. So all the stuff that is kind of what this thing is trying to work around to make sure that the space is being comfortable. So this is the information you find from maintenance display. So you may find more. Like when a linkage made this display, tells me what the mode of the whole system is doing right now in cooling, where my air source is, you know, what are the temperatures that we're dealing with. If I have uh, other things we want to do some resetting from, all this stuff is in here. So, again, um, this is data that, that, that you use to find valuable if you want to try to figure out why a controller is doing what it's doing. The maintenance display is very valuable. And again, this data. Is live data it's coming back. So all of this stuff is updated every five seconds or so. So you're seeing what's going on on a real time basis. The next thing you see on here, configuration service and set point, all these, these four are configuration screens. Okay. Configuration screens mean that I can put data into here and download that data into the controller, and the controller will operate around those parameters that I did. Again, this is an application specific controller. So it knows it's a fan box VAV. So it knows it's going to control a fan. It knows it's going to have a VAV box to it. So what I have to do is tell it the parameters to do it. So if I go to the service configuration, you can 
can see here are my basic tables that I want to do to enter my information. I don't have to write the program that tells it to be any block. It knows that. It just has to know the parameters to operate around. For instance, what are my airflows? Cooling minimum, cooling maximum. Where do I want my damper to be in any particular position? Okay, I enter that information in. Now, one thing about these particular tables right here being that they are configuration tables. When you load one of these up and you go into here, this is the last thing the computer remembers seeing, that this computer remembers seeing. It's not necessarily the information that's in their control. Vitally important if you're doing something that other people have also have access to the job. Okay, with ID that goes away, but for a service tool, when you're looking at a job and you're looking at something you've seen before, but you may not be the last one in here, you, it's better to hit this little up arrow first right away. It goes and grabs the information from the controller, brings it up, and puts it on the screen. Over. If you're watching the screen when that happens, you'll know that if anybody has changed the parameters that have that uh, since you've been there last. So that's a, that's also a clue that someone else has been screwing around with it. Okay, but when you do something within here and you want to change something, say I want to change the cool minimum from 100 to 150 CFM. Okay. I've just changed it now. All I've done was change my screen. I haven't done anything to the controller at all until I hit this download arrow. If I hit that download arrow, it goes back into the machine itself, and now that data is set into it. If I don't hit the download arrow, it doesn't do anything to stay on my screen. I also probably want to hit the save button here. And now what I've done to the machine, I've done to my computer also, so I'll remember what it's done. The save and download are two words you usually hear with any configuration screen or service tool. Okay? And again, configuration screen, depending on what you have here, will let you do things. This lets me put my primary damper size in here, my type of um, unit that I have. It lets me put my damper PID loop in here. You can see the configurations I can change, but they're all focused on this being a fan box. I don't have to learn any custom program or any fancy stuff in here. Okay, same with set points. These are my base set points, and this doesn't, this is not affected by the slide bar. These are the base set points that the slide bar operates around. So my up one, I mean the same, I can make the changes there. When you use it, when you get into the configuration part of this, normally, again, not always, but normally these are more system functions. It's where do I want my alarms to go? If I want to put my alarms in, where do I want them to go? This is where I put that in. It's a system function. Linkage function. Am I on a linkage controller? Who am I controlling? What am I doing? That's a system function. It's not its own function necessarily. Same thing with holiday schedules and the like. So most of the system stuff, broadcast, those kind of things, are done from the configuration side of something, where the server side is more specific to the individual controller itself, setting up the parameters that it's going to operate on. And time schedules are pretty well self-explanatory. Do I still get time right or we're over 11 30. You're, you're okay if you want to go a little bit more. Yeah, a few okay. more points here. Um, I want to think a little bit about time schedules. Um, just because time schedules on a VAB system or a VDP system without a front end in it, they just had a system pilot. Normally, what they have is global schedules. And those global schedules configurations change a little bit with IV. But when you put in a when you put in a schedule number, every device has the ability to have a schedule number. When you put a schedule number in here, if that number is a zero, that means that controller is going to control 24 hours a day, seven. It's going to be occupied 24 seven. If it's between one and 64, including all those 64 addresses, it means that the controller is going to follow his own schedule. Okay. It's not close to anybody else. It's just gonna, I'm going to have to schedule it put in here and the schedule I'm going to follow. When you have something like 65 through 99 in there, that's a global schedule. And most of the VAB systems and VDP systems that we put in prior to IBU had global schedules in there. A global schedule means that this guy is not going to follow his own schedule. He's going to follow a schedule from somebody else. And you don't know where that's coming from necessarily. You just know that. He's getting it from somebody else. Unless this box right here is checked. All we ask is that anybody can have the schedule 65 or a global schedule and a schedule number. And it could be from different systems, it could be on different buses, it doesn't matter. Anybody can follow their schedule. The rule is that one 
and only one of these guys can be the schedule map. So that makes it a little bit harder to find who's giving the schedule if you want to change the schedule. We've tried to make it the highest VAD box as a rule of thumb to do the schedule. If a building followed all one schedule and it had VADs in multiple systems, the highest VAD box would normally be the schedule map. But that's not always true, and you may have more than one schedule map. But the, but the thing I want to get at here is that this, this thing may or may not have its own schedule in it. And so when you go to try to change things, you have to understand where the schedule number is and what it follows. Okay? When IV came along, it came a whole different. Everybody was set back to 64 in here, and everybody followed its own schedule because IV then is the best thing IV does is take schedules graphically and dump them into the controllers automatically. So now we have no need to have global schedules. We just needed to have uh, its own schedule and IV to do the rest. But pre IU, when they had a system pilot on the bus or something, they're probably going to have global schedules. And you're going to have to find out where the schedule master is. It's not always easy to find. And here's and this is my lowest address of the bus, and you can see my broadcast and broadcast acknowledgement is a yes. In service tool, if you want to change a toggle from a yes to a no or a no to a yes, you hit the space bar. I can't tell you how many times I've got a question of how do I change that. You can't put a no, an N in there or a yes in there or a type of, you just hit the space bar and change the toggle from one to the other. Okay. So that's this. Now, I said this as a kind of thing. If I go to my rooftop here, you see the same information here. The same drop down, the same thing happens here. If I go to status here, you see I got two tables here to look at. My basic status is here, and you can see this. I do not have a space temperature sensor physically wired in this thing. I'm getting it from my linkage master. He's telling me what the system space temperature is, and my rooftop is following that because that's the information showing up. Okay, so this is the parameter of the system. I can change my color from here, I can force my damper from here because it's dark. I can turn my fan on and off from here. So, a lot of stuff we can do right in the center screen. Again, it's live data coming back from the controller on my screen. I don't have an outside air sensor here, so I call it low. Maintenance on here. You'll see that the information, this thing keeps track of the hours of the pressure run times. It tells you right here. Whenever you see the word submaster reference, submaster reference is usually and it's always the set point for the discharge air temperature to meet the master or the space temperature they want. So when you see the word master, it usually refers to the space temperature or the controlling set point of something. The submaster is the discharge air temperature it's going to take to achieve that space temperature. In this case, we're not calling for heat, so it doesn't want the heat to come on. We're not calling for cooling, so it says control at 150 degrees. Same the economizer. If you had a need for heating or cooling from the system, you would change the submaster with the go and the rooftop problem would respond by trying to maintain a discharge temperature based upon what that submaster reference is. Okay? It's a little confusing, but those are words you may want to see when you're going along here. Here's my linkage output right here. You can see that it is compiling the data from the zoning system and telling me what it's doing. There's a difference between the average zone temperature and the average occupied zone temperature. If you had a time schedule there that was doing that was uh, that was controlling some parts of the building different than others, but most of the time it would be the same. Very unoccupied, this average zone temperature becomes good. Occupied zone temperature becomes good. It also tells me who my master element is as far as my linkage goes. So again, this is the maintenance screen. Tell me stuff that's going on within the system, so I know what the hell, what what the unit is actually doing. These are the ones you refer to when something's not operating right, but all the, all the data team shows when it's not operating right, the maintenance displays are, are certainly the thing that you turn to. Again, configurations and service configs, same kind of deal that travels here. This is pertinent to this two units where you set the information zip for the unit itself. The configuration part of it is set for the system functions that would happen up here. Some of the things that it's like, we're going to broadcast my outside air, we're going to schedule my broadcast, all the things that were pertinent to the information on the system part of it, come out of the configuration side of it, the stuff that goes to just to the device itself comes on the service part of it. What's my PID, what's my cooling, my readings, those kind of things. Okay. That's probably an actual stopping point, Ryan, for. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, the status and service are kind of like view only things, the config. 
uh, SUMI status and maintenance are view only, config and service are set up, and then set up and time schedules are like the end users type of things that they access. Um, right. Those are the programmable things. And again, for the application specific stuff, you don't have to write the program for the box. You just have to get the data that the box you want to control it uh, there's been a few questions. I've been trying to answer them as we go, uh, but I'm going to answer a couple more broader ones. Uh, several folks asked where they could get the recording of this. It'll take me a few hours to get the file compiled and uploaded, but then all of the recordings for all of the webinars that we do get posted on our website, tecmongo.com. And then if you click on training and then click online, you can see all of the previously recorded uh, webinars. And there's there's hundreds of them. There's a lot on there. Uh, that's, that was a question that came up a few times. And then a few other folks have asked uh, if we plan on holding the, the original hands-on class at some point. Uh, yes, we will do that. We're not going to be able to do that this spring and summer, the, the rules of the state, and it's just not going to allow it. Uh, and if we go do up in Wisconsin, it's going to still be restrictive in that regard too. So we'll probably do it sometime, hopefully, fingers crossed under, under my desk here, but hopefully in the fall, maybe we can... Uh, we can meet again with a group of you know 15 20 people and do actual on the table live programming with the software uh because that will be we, we understand dan and i both know it's hard to get too much out of a webinar versus doing it yourself we get it uh so we want to do this to kind of tide you over and then we do plan on hosting it again whenever we're allowed to do it um i don't see any other questions right now that that we have not answered already how about about if they want to get some, uh, we can put some data together. If they want some spec sheets or old books in here, we can probably step it out of a webinar, right? Yeah, we anybody who needs anything, uh, we can we can send that to you. Um, some stuff's on HVAC Partners for you guys that use that, which is fine. Uh, but other stuff's much harder to get hunt down. Like if you're looking for like a Gen two VVT book or something like that, good luck finding that anywhere. If you call Dan or if you call I, um, we would we would have it probably. I have it on my computer. I know I'm sure Dan does too. Um, yeah. I, get Gen 1 stuff, so yeah. I do have some Gen 1 stuff if you need it. We, 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 should, we should trade libraries at some point and see who has older stuff. I'm sure it's you, but um, but if you guys need something specific, just let us know and we'll try to hunt it down for you. There's there's hundreds of documents that are involved. Each one of these products, each widget has three or four of its own books. So uh, And the Comfort Controller book is like 500 pages. I mean, there's a lot of data available. If you need something, let us know. Yeah, the, main, the, main, the main thing is that we want to support this thing because the last thing I ever want to hear is someone because our name is on that corner status is being an expert in a carrier. I'm like, carrier, carrier, you know. So, but my uh, my thing is I support. I don't care who put it in. If you guys did or someone else did, but if you got a question or you got some issues, um, uh, give us a call because um, my main focus here is to keep these systems working. So, cool. Well, thank you guys, Dan. Thank you as well. I appreciate it. And um, we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.